Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight's program, Fanny Barrier Williams, 100 Years After Suffrage and the Legacies of Race, Gender, and Civic Voice, is in honor of the local progressive era African American suffragist, writer, orator, and social justice reformer, Fanny Barrier Williams. Williams was born in Brockport, New York, and in 1870 was the first African American woman to graduate from the then Brockport Normal School, now the College of Brockport. An extraordinary woman, she was the first African American admitted to the prestigious Chicago's Women's Club. Nonetheless, Williams is not a familiar name in either suffrage history, women's history, or civil rights history today. Tonight's talk will place Williams front and center in commemorating the centennial passage of the 19th Amendment and in taking up questions on race, gender, and empire through the focus of her life. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Barbara Savoy. Dr. Barbara Savoy is Associate Professor in the Department of Women and Gender Studies at the College of Brockport, SUNY. She served as Director, then Chair, over a span of 12 consecutive years where she built a small program into its current department status. She teaches feminist theory, global perspectives on women and gender, gender, race, and class, and the Senior Seminar on Women and Gender Studies. Her research and publication areas include women's global human rights, identity politics and literature and popular culture, and historical to contemporary perspectives on gender equality. Her most recent scholarship includes two forthcoming co-authored book chapters, Seneca Falls and Legacies of Women's Rights, and Technologies of Affect in Memorializing Holocaust Trauma. Dr. Ella Savoy serves as lead faculty for a global classroom linking students at the College of Brockport with students at Veliki Novgorod State University in Russia, and she has taught a women and gender studies seminar for several summers at the New York St. Petersburg Institute of Linguistics, Cognition and Culture, NYI in St. Petersburg, Russia. Among her many accolades, Dr. Lil Savoy is the 2017 recipient of the Brockport Presidential Award for Teaching Excellence. Without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Barbara Lil Savoy. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. I'm so thrilled to be here. So just a couple of, and thanks for that wonderful um, introduction and welcome everybody. I just want to mention that my talk tonight runs about 44 to 45 minutes. I'm reading from a paper that I've written. I am going to stick really closely to my paper. It helps me keep track of time. Just stick with it and then we'll have an opportunity at the end to have a conversation for you to ask questions and talk about Fanny. So I want to begin by thanking Brandon Fass and the Central Library of Rochester and Monroe County for inviting me to speak here today. I raised both my daughters in libraries where we spent so many hours playing, reading, listening, and engaging with others and ourselves in our community around books and media. And libraries are so important for my academic work. I'm grateful for the library, both brick and mortar and virtual. So I'm honored to participate tonight and partner with the library in this suffrage speaking series. I know these are very strange and dislocated times as we meet virtually. I hope everyone joining tonight is safe and well and able to take what you can from tonight's lecture and every day as we carry on in this challenging time. So, um, as Brandon said, my talk tonight spotlights Fanny Barrier Williams, a progressive era African American writer, orator, and suffrage reformer who championed Black women's civic, civil liberties in an era fraught with both racism and sexism. Despite Williams' many accomplishments in fighting Jim Crow and globally as the only Black woman presenter at the 1893 world parliament of religions, she's relatively unknown in national and transnational discourses that document women's rights history. Foregrounding Williams and commemorating the centennial 19th amendment passage, my talk examines race, gender, and empire and focuses on the mythologizing of equality for all women as it intersects suffrage movements. So before I jump into my talk, and my apologies, because I know some of my students were present in my suffrage talk, but I'm just using a qualifier that I wrote for that talk that bears repeating here. And so as, I, as we jump in and look at Fanny Barry Williams' portrait on this 100-year milestone, 
let's remember collectively that the 19th Amendment did not enfranchise all US women as race, racism, and remnants of slavery, especially in the South, prevented many women of color and other non-whites from exercising their voting rights. Obstacles constructed and introduced at the state level included literacy tests, poll taxes, and English language requirements, just to name a few examples. It was not until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that the intent of the 19th Amendment was fully realized. I mentioned these exclusions as I opened my talk, the movement of Black Lives as backdrop, because we must, with diligence and intent, recognize that racial inequalities continue to persist today, whether at the voting booth, in the political arena, or standing at the local corner traffic light. The prison industrial system, which disenfranchises citizens behind bars, further amplifies racial and ethnic disparities in voting rights. So thank you for um, allowing me to repeat that important qualifier. So it's incredibly meaningful for me to say a few words about Fannie Barry Williams in the context of an election year and more specifically in the context of 2020 and the 100 year commemoration of the passage of the 19th Amendment. I often say in my classes that place matters and by this I mean where we start in life, our geographies impact opportunity. Speaking to you from my home in Rochester, New York, with Susan B. Anthony's grave, a stone's throw from my office window, and really it's a little bit more than a stone's throw, but if I look out my office window and sort of make a beeline directly for Susan B. Anthony's grave. And I mention this because the importance is about the power of place and Rochester is significant in the sense that it is the modern birthplace of um, women's rights, so very important. But the power of place is not the same for everyone. So as we mark the 19th Amendment milestone in this power of place, we must recognize both its historical importance, but also the unequal effects of the legislation, as I just mentioned in my opening remarks. 2020 is an election year whose outcome will have important and significant consequences for our planet and the most vulnerable among us, which includes women and people of color. I have the word intersectional on the slide, and it's a term that we use frequently today, but sometimes with mismeaning. So a moment of clarification. When we, when we say intersectional, many think we are simply talking about the ways that more than one social category of identity, race and gender as an example, touches or overlaps. But when we say intersectional, we are more specifically talking about ways power shifts when those categories of identity touch or intersect. Thus, this is not simply the accumulation of more than one social identity category, but rather ways power dynamics shift because of these intersections. So I'm going to close my talk tonight with a word or two about intersectional thinking because it directly bears on Barry Williams' story. So open with the framing of the word here as context. With that, in this talk, I hope to provoke discussion, inspire action, and foster community in this important 2020 watershed moment. So I speak to you today as a women and gender studies scholar where I teach research and write on social equality measures. But more so I also speak as a faculty representative of my discipline where the knowledge that we examine and disseminate in the classroom and apply broadly in the field is rooted in fighting for gender and social justice causes. From this women and gender studies vista, we understand struggle. The sense of challenge and surmounting obstacle is at the center of my discipline. My academic work seeks to explain the way systems of power and dominance operate in society, and my activism seeks to push back against exclusions that privilege some while exclude others. In no other context or circumstance is this struggle more clear than at the intersections of gender, race, and class standing, 
of which Fanny Bear Williams came to understand firsthand. So she was born on February 12, 1855 in Brockport, New York, the youngest of Anthony, Anthony and Harriet Barrier. They were one of the few black families residing in the over, overwhelmingly white community. Fanny's father, Anthony, owned a profitable business. He was actually a barber and um, built a real estate portfolio, and he became a leading citizen. This is in Brockport, New York, where Fanny was born. Her mother, Harriet, led a life very similar to her white female neighbors, spending most of her time raising three children and never working outside the home. The family became members of the predominantly white Baptist church in the village of Brockport, and that church is still there today. Important to my academic poem, as the slide um, depicts, in 1870, Barry Williams became the first African-American woman to graduate from SUNY Brockport, then known as the Brockport Normal School. The college has long admired her story and record, and we have sought to ensure her legacy is recognized and elevated so that the public comes to know and appreciate her accomplishments. In 2002, the College Development Office inducted Williams into Brockport's alumni Hall of Heritage. And then in 2015, the college established a scholarship and several of us now organize and hold a biennial luncheon in her memory. That biennial luncheon would have been this fall absent of the, the pandemic. So it would have been probably right about, about now. Importantly, as pictured on the slide, we installed a permanent plaque of Williams on the entrance to the college's oldest building, Hartwell Hall, which is pictured on the slide to the left of the plaque. My goal is to raise enough funds so that we can commission a statue of Fanny Barry Williams that's installed on our campus. It's something that we're studying as I speak. And with the important takedown of for Confederate statues across the country, it really is Fanny's time to rise and step forward. So it is a really important endeavor as we see her legacy and her memory forward. So with a desire to explore the world outside of the small village of Brockport and to assist newly freed people in the South, Williams left the village of Brockport and moved first to Hannibal, Missouri. As pictured on the slide in Missouri, she taught in the Douglas School, a segregated school for black children. When you read about Williams, you discover that she experienced severe racism in Missouri, which was very different from her experiences in Western New York, particularly in the village of Brockport. Despite these hardships, Williams worked for nearly two years at the Douglas School before relocating to Washington, DC. Earning a teaching position at the all black school system there, she taught in the primary grades. In 1884, she took a leave of absence to explore her artistic talents at the New England Conservatory in Boston. And then she returned to DC and she immersed herself in her teaching career and she enjoyed the black aristocratic culture of the city. In 1887, she married Samuel Lang Williams, pictured on this slide, a graduate of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and Columbia Law School, now George Washington University. The couple moved to Chicago, where Barry Williams' husband opened a law practice with Ferdinand Barnett, one of the leading citizens in the city, and the husband of Ida B. Wells Barnett, who I mentioned briefly in a few moments. It was in Chicago that Fanny Barry Williams became one of the more celebrated fixtures, uh, figures of her time, although she's still very unknown comparative to someone like Ida B. Wells Barnett, who has a street named after her in um, Chicago. So while she became well known, she's still underknown in so many circles. Uh, it was uh, in Chicago that, um, in Illinois, that she joined forces with black aristocrats assisting with the development of a literary society, the building of the first black hospital in the city and the creation of 
a statewide black female club movement. And she was very, very engaged in uh, uh, movement color, uh, women of color club movement, something that she was very committed to. She was friendly with Jane Addams and was involved in Hull House, which is very significant to Chicago history. I can talk a little bit about that um, during the Q&A. She also crossed racial boundaries by engaging with white men and women, Jane Addams being an example of that. And she became a member of one of the most prominent Unitarian churches in the city. She was elected an officer in a female labor organization devoted to minimizing the impact of industrialization on women and children. Importantly, and something she is not well credited for, Williams engaged with black and white women in the campaign for women's right to vote in municipal elections. As we mark this 100th year suffrage history, we must remember Williams as a suffrage fighter. Related to her suffrage and social justice activism, Williams worked alongside the likes of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, to name just two, both so well known to our New York suffrage narrative. And they're both pictured here on the slide and familiar images to many. Williams credits Susan B. Anthony for her racial sensitivity. And yet in their reach for the vote, both Stanton and Anthony worked closely with Southern women more than with Williams and women of color. Very important. Williams was an eloquent, eloquent speaker and writer and a leader who saw beyond racial boundaries and oppressions and her insights into the intersectional struggles of living as a woman of color during a time of gender and racial division in American history is very, very important. So um, published in the illustrated monthly magazine that was titled The Voice of the Negro in November, 1994. And this slide shows an archive image of this publication. Barrier Williams wrote on the status of women and race in an essay titled, quote, a woman's part in a man's business, end of quote. I'm just gonna read for you a little bit of her writing. Quote, I do not think it too much to say the American Negro woman is the most interesting in this country. I do not say this in any boastful spirit, but I simply mean that she is the only woman whose career lies wholly in front of her. She has no history, no traditions, no race idealism, no inherited resources, and no established race character. She is the only woman in America who is almost unknown, the only woman for whom nothing is done, the only woman without sufficient defenders when assailed, the only woman for who is still outside of that world of chivalry that in all the ages has hypothesized women kind." End of quote. Williams' words here as penned in the year 1904 poignantly capture the intersecting racial and gender paradox facing black women of the period. And despite our country's progress in reaching for sex, gender and racial parity, many of these words still resonate with us today. Dr. Wanda Hendricks, professor of history at University of South Carolina, is author of the only biography of Fanny Barry Williams published in 2014, entitled Fanny Barry Williams, Crossing the Borders of Re Region and Race, as the image shows. And this is a picture of Dr. Hendricks speaking at Brockport, which was our second biennial Fanny Barry Williams luncheon, and Dr. Hendricks was our keynote. Hendricks describes Williams' prolific career as a reform activist and writer and emphasizes that Williams authored more than 50 articles and essays in major periodicals of the period, delivered many speeches to both black and white audiences, and was a major architect in the shaping of black life during the progressive era. Hendricks notes that Williams' practical and implementable solutions 
to the myriad of social, political, and economic problems facing uh, that, that the country faced during the 19th and early 20th century made her a popular lecturer at conventions and clubs across the country. In her speeches and writings, she espoused better working conditions for laborers, the eradication of debilitating racial policies, better educational access for Black children, and an end to discrimination against women. And so that intersectional piece is so evident as you think about her fighting for the needs of her race and also for her sex and gender. Williams was a friend and supporter of two of the most prominent Black leaders in our and her lifetime, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, both pictured on this slide. She met Douglas while residing in Brockport, socialized with him when the two lived in Washington and hosted him in her home when he traveled to Chicago. The two often attended and presented at the same suffrage conferences. And when Booker T. Washington filled uh, the leadership vacuum after Douglas's death in 1985, Barry Williams became a strong advocate of his popular industrial education model of teaching the masses of under and uneducated black people as a consequence of being denied access to educational resources. Several black intellectuals such as W.E. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells Barnett publicly criticized Washington's model as well as what they argued was his acquiescence to Southern white supremacy. Barry Williams, a trained educator and intellectual herself, became one of Washington's primary defenders, but she, like Washington, faced criticism in this realm. And this is an image of Du Bois and Ida B. Wells Barnett. I want to mention that in relatively a whole different topic or whole other arm, there's this lot written about Washington and Du Bois having um, different points of view, but there's also a lot of intersections in their work. So the fact that Barry Williams defended Washington did not mean that she was abandoning um, some of the principles of those that Du Bois um, argued, which was more for higher education, whereas Washington was more for practical education um, for um, supporting the workforce. Related to Washington, one area that Barry Williams wrote and spoke on were the labor restrictions African and American women of the period faced, and some questioned her gender and abolitionist position in this regard, sort of related to her support of Washington. Williams' writings are complex in this regard, and I want to take a moment to consider a couple of examples. I just realized that there's this really weird um, Chuck image on the slide, and in that, what should be in that image, my apologies, you never know how this is gonna translate, um, is the, um, the name of the author of the book that you're hearing, that you're seeing rather, um, William's writings um, are collected here. So I have pictured on the slide is the new woman of color, the collected writings of Fannie Barry Williams um, in the period of 1830 and 1918. And in that checker box is the editor her name is Mary Jo Deegan, and it is the date of the publication, which is the year 2002. So importantly, this preceded Dr. Hendricks, Wanda Hendricks biography of Barry Williams. And the preface of this book does give you some biographical information about Barry Williams, so it's important, but it's really more of a resource and a collection of her writings and very valuable. Um, in that regard. So both Wanda Hendrick's book and this book are important contributions as we remember the legacy of Barry Williams' work. You can examine much of Barry Williams' writings in this collection. And right now I'm gonna read to you um, a quote from a piece titled, The Problem of Employment for Negro Women as an example of Barry Williams' writing on African-American women and domestic labor. Quote, I do not wish to be misunderstood as advocating the restriction of colored girls to the house service, even when that service is elevated to the rank of a profession. My only plea is that we shall protect and respect our girls who honestly and intelligently 
enter this service either from preference or necessity. It seems to me that we lose a great opportunity if we fail to take hold of this problem in a thoroughly broad and philosophic way and work out its solutions. And so it's a very nuanced, sophisticated way that we look at the need to work. Uh, quoting Deegan, Barry Williams was not advocating Washington's position, and Deegan writes that of acceptance of restricted lower status. Rather, Williams argued on behalf of survival techniques and an intellectual and philosophical approach to broaden the options for women who were, and it's my own emphasis on the word were, restricted in their choices. Along these lines, some scholars argue that Barry Williams was an elitist and point to her earlier versus later speeches and writings as evidence. I would argue that these early to later shifts in tone are better attributed to the differences between an emerging versus a more informed and developed voice as both speaker and writer. And this is something I and many scholars like Williams can easily relate as we begin our careers and then we become more informed and secure in our own voice. So here's an example of a later piece of writing from a piece called, titled Colored Women of Chicago. And she penned this in 1914. So it's a decade later than the, the example I just read from 1903. Quote, the women who work with their hands in the humbler walks of life as cooks, house cleaners, laundresses, caretakers, and domestics. One of the most interesting sights in our public streets in the early morning hours is the large army of colored women going in all directions to their day's work. These women deserve great credit for their eager willingness to aid their husbands and helping to provide a living for themselves and their families. A comparative anal as comparative analysis, many labor socialists and suffrage fighters in Europe and Russia, as example, argued that to be closer to work was to be closer to liberation. So the context of race and more specifically emancipation from slavery complicate, complicate this, act, this for activists like Barry Williams who straddled an intersectional battle for both gender and racial equity. A related but very important note is the context of this piece in 1914, Chicago women had just won the municipal franchise. This is important here because as Deegan notes, Barry Williams saw this as a victory for growing civil rights of African American people, both men and women. And so while she was writing about the significance of women's labor as contributions to the household, at the same moment with her strong involvement and advocacy for women of color and the club movement in Chicago, she saw the municipal suffrage milestone as one that would lift up women and help them combat both racism and sexism. Sorry about that. Um, and I, um, yeah, and I, I don't know where that like little snippet came from, but I'm sorry about that, um, that slide. So related to her allegiances with Washington, Williams appeared in several publications with him as this slide documents. And she wrote articles praising him and his industrial model. Again, while this it might be one area of critique on Barry Williams, her connection to Washington made her a very powerful Black woman of the era. Despite her being unknown, she had incredible voice in her connection with him. So adding to what were remar many remarkable first, Williams was one of a small group of Black women who spoke at the World Columbian Exposition in 1893, also known as the World Fair in Chicago. And this is an image, not an archival image from that 1893 event. So these are some of Barry Williams' closing words at the Columbian ex Exhibition in 1893, quote, that everywhere in the wake of enlightened womanhood, our women are seen and felt for the good they diffuse, 
the Congress will at once see the fullness of our fellowship and help us to avert the arrows of prejudice that pierce the souls because of the color of our bodies." End of quote. So an important side note about the exhibition. Rachel Tibben, writing in the Daily, it's a sort of online newspaper this past March 2020, notes that neither women nor African Americans were part of the fair's planning stages, nor were they allowed to play any prominent role in the substance of the exhibition. As a supposed compromise, the all-male male Board of Governors approved what was the Women's Building as a substitute and a Board of Lady Managers as a consolation prize for denying women even one seat on the board. And the board was an affair, I should mention, the affair was supported by government. And in fact, the president appointed the board, president of the United States appointed the board, which was all white men. White women's limited role in the fair didn't make them sympathetic to the near total exclusion of African-American women and men. Historian Ann Masser writes that when black women requested a seat among the 150 lady managers, the white women refused them. They complained that they couldn't pick from among several groups of black women, activists, and thus would seat none at all. And those several groups of women included Fanny, um, Ida B. Wells Barnett, who mentioned Mary Church Terrell, to name just a few of the prominent women of color voices at that time. They ultimately offered an unpaid secretarial role to Fanny Barry Williams, a college graduate and an accomplished educator. She was unhappy with this sort of token, but she took it because it was literally the only professional role a black woman could fill at the exposition. And it is an example also of ways we take little pieces of the pie as we're also reaching for much bigger and important shares. Adding to impressive first, Barry Williams was the only black woman who was a presenter on the main program at the Parliament of Religions in 1893, as I mentioned in my opening comments. As this photo shows, she broke into what was largely an all male space. Wanda Hendrick, Dr. Hendrick, writing on Barry Williams' participation at the Parliament, emphasizes that her speech, which was titled, What Can Religion Further Do to Advance the Condition of the American Negro? End of quote. Excuse me, revealed two important themes. One was the difference between the concept of religion and the institutionalized church. And the second was that religious leadership was central to minimizing the impact of racism and discrimination against Blacks. Barry Williams' words, as quoted from Hendricks, and this is the quote, it should be the province of religion to unite and not separate men and women according to superficial differences of race lines. And in that quote, it shows Barry Williams' vision of unity across racial division. As a strong advocate for equality, Barry Williams constantly and consistently broke down the boundaries of Jim Crow. On the local level, her nomination to the All White Chicago Women's Club in 1894 created so much controversy that several members of the organization threatened to resign. For nearly two years, club membership debated with each other about whether a Black woman was qualified to be a member of their club. Ultimately, Barry Williams' nom nomination forced the club's women to confront their own racism and change the constitution. She became a member in 1896. And pictured on this slide is the founders and first um, club charter, the first group, so to speak. So she broke into that. It was very important. So with all we know about Barry Williams, there's so much about her that's still overlooked. Her tireless work behind the scenes, definitely. But as we have seen, the very dominant role she played in national affairs. One snippet I want to share is from the National American Suffrage Convention held in Chicago 
over February 14th through the 19th in the year 1907. And pictured here is an archive image of that program. The second day of the conference was dedicated to remembering Susan B. Anthony and celebrating what would have been Miss Anthony's 87th birthday. And also important to note that Miss Anthony was often, often, was always present at these meetings with the exception of two times. So she would have been present had she been alive. Taken from the History of Women's Suffrage, edited by Ida Husted Harper, Harper, Barry Williams gave a eulogy of Susan B. Anthony at the meeting, which is recorded as follows. And so she was introduced by a speaker. This is her introduction. Miss Bar Miss Fanny Bar Mrs. Fanny Barry Williams of Chicago paid touching tribute on behalf of colored people. And then these are Miss, Mrs. Barry Williams' words delivered at the meeting. Quote, my presence on this platform shows the gracious spirit of Miss Anthony still survives in her followers. When Miss Anthony took up the cause of women, she did not know them by color, nationality, creed, or birth. She stood only for the emancipation of women from the thraldom of sex. She became an invincible champion of anti-slavery in the half century of her unremitting struggle for liberty, more liberty, and complete liberty for Negro men and women in chains and for white women in their helpless subjection to man's law, she never wavered, never doubted, never compromised. She held it to be mockery to ask man or woman to be happy or content, if not free. She saw no substitute for liberty. When slavery was overthrown and the work of reconstruction began, she was still unwearied and watchful. She had an intimate acquaintance with the leading statesmen of the time. Her judgment and advice were respected and heard in much of the legislation that gave a status of citizenship to the millions of slaves set free." End of her quote. It, it's so interesting to me that with all that we know about Susan B. Anthony, and especially here in Rochester, that we don't shine more light on less visible, but remarkable women of color like Fanny Barry Williams, whose life and work intersected Susan B. Anthony's path. Many might say that Barry Williams, whose life and work um, many might say that Fanny, Fanny Barry Williams is an unsung shero in this regard. I complicate this a bit by arguing that not knowing about Barry Williams evidences ways systemic racism at the intersections of sex and gender have minimized and erased Black women and Indigenous women more so than other populations. That my own two daughters, born, raised, and educated in Brockport, New York, know about Barry Williams because of my work, rather than their education in the school district, says that our textbook history lessons are significantly lacking. So as I start winding down my talk, giving you like a little signal that I'm, I'm getting close, um, I'd like to circle back to the significance of Rochester and Western New York as an aspect of place. Prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment, we can point to Rochester and then up the road, Seneca Falls and the 1848 Declaration of Sentiments as a powerful narrative that contemporary activists continue to employ even as it potentially sidelines other narratives that could have developed in its place. My colleagues, Jill Sriansicki, Deborah Uman, both at St. John Fisher and Maria Brandt um, at Monroe Community College, and I just finished authoring a chapter that just published. Um, I have the book sitting here to the right of me about some of the mythologizing and rhetoric unique to Seneca Falls. And so I'm taking that work and I'm quoting from it um, and applying it here to my work on Fanny Barrier Williams. So imagine, um, for example, if 
Fanny Barry Williams had emerged as a canonized storyteller of women's rights alongside Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Susan B. Anthony, then the origin story of American feminism would likely have included a fiercer stance against racism, a more ardent effort toward black suffrage, a broader reach towards racial inclusivity. The ongoing challenge for us today, standing here in Rochester or Western New York or really anywhere across the US is how to employ the suffered story without once again compromising other histories. Our strategic telling and retelling of the who and what of suffrage during this 100th year 19th Amendment milestone offers us the opportunity to examine and transform the privilege of identity and place. And pictured on the side is the Declaration of Sentiments um, and to the right, the, um, the first convention for women's rights. It's interesting that the Declaration of Sent Sentiments, just a side note, gets mythologized a lot in that Susan B. Anthony, so well known, is often put at the table of signing the declaration, but she wasn't even present. So it's a way that that sort of takes on momentum and further fuels what becomes a very dominant narrative about what we know versus what really happened. With that, I wanna mention that in February this year, President Heidi McPherson, on behalf of my campus, SUNY Brockport, submitted a nomination of Fannie Barry Williams for inclusion in the Women's Rights Hall of Fame as pictured here. And it's just moved into this beautiful new location in the mill that you see on the slide. Importantly, this is Fannie Barry Williams' second nomination into the Hall of Fame. In 2016, Dr. Wanda Hendricks, Barry Williams' biographer, submitted her first nomination. Recognizing Barry Williams in this particular place is an important opportunity to correct past racial exclusions and at a very salient moment in our history where a nation pauses to commemorate the passage of the 19th Amendment while also recognizes, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that because of racism and obstacles introduced at state and local levels, the amendment's long sought passage did not guarantee voting rights for all women. With this second nomination, I am hopeful, Dr. Hendricks is hopeful, there are so many of us that are hopeful that Fannie Barry Williams will finally gain a rightful seat among so many other distinguished women. Fannie Barry Williams was a persister. We are persisters. We must persist. And I don't know when the announcement is coming about who's in the new class of inductees, but we're bound to hear about that very, very soon. So it is 2020 and with this 100th year milestone, many eyes are pointed to us here in Western New York, Rochester in particular because of our uh, allegiances and connection to so many suffrage fighters here, Susie B. Anthony to name just one. And just a short distance from Rochester is Fannie Barry Williams' birthplace and her burial depicted in this slide. The middle picture is Barry Williams' newspaper obituary. And I just wanna read a, a few words to you. It's important because it helps summarize everything that I've mentioned in my talk and gives us just a good closing point. So the demise of Miss Fannie Barry Williams of Erie Street, well, street in our village, occurred Saturday at her home after a long illness about 89 years of age, and that about is about not, um, not having the exact um, date of her birth, but it, it reads about 89 years of age. Miss Williams was born in Brockport, and after residing in other parts of the country, returned here in 1926. Her father, George Barrier, formerly um, uh, had a barber shop, as I mentioned, in the village, and he was um, a prominent businessman. She was educated at the New England Conservatory of Music and the School of Fine Arts in Washington, D.C., in which city she also taught school following her marriage to lawyer Samuel Lang Williams. Um, 
she, um, who um, it mentions that he was, in this article, it mentions that he was the first Negro admitted to the Chicago bar. And I mentioned in, you know, practicing a speech that I don't believe that's true. Um, Lloyd Garrison Wheeler uh, was also, is listed as being inducted as first, but he left Chicago shortly after being inducted. So it could be why Williams was attributed to being first. And importantly, I can't get into a library right now or really search those archives, but it's a really good question about who was first. But in this obituary, it, it claims that he was the first Negro admitted into the Chicago bar. Miss, uh, Mrs. Williams resided for many years in Chicago where she was active in so many organizations. She was a member of the city library board. And I think that's so important as I open by saying how important libraries were. It's reassuring to know that she had access to the library at a time of racial um, restrictions. And she was a life member of uh, the Women's City Club of Chicago. Again, so important to her. Um, participation in the Women of Color Club movement in Chicago. She traversed and intersected uh, and lectured extensively rather. And she, at the time of this obituary, she was, was survived by her sister and a niece. And it says few funeral services were conducted Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. And she is buried in Brockport Cemetery. And there you see her gravesite. And next to her is her sister, Ella. So um, I just want to do a quick plug and I'm going to take you to this site and Linda Maroney's Women and the Vote New York State is coming up next Monday, I think. Brandon can um, qualify that. And um, it's such an important, this is her site. Um, prior to this site, I should mention that Linda um, produced a film um, which documents importantly the, um, the um, pilgrimage of of everyone in 2016 going to Susan B. Anthony's grave and leaving their I Voted sticker. And it's a remarkable documentary, very, very important. And this is a second part of her project connected to that, which is Women in the Vote New York State. And in this project, Linda Maroney is mapping and trying to collect all of the important individuals who were suffrage fighters and fought for women's right to vote. And so I did enter Fannie Barry Williams in the database. Um, I just want to thank Linda Maroney for cleaning up what I entered. I entered it rather quickly and wanted to get it on the map. Um, my plate was incredibly full with so much. And they, um, Linda and her colleagues just polished that up beautifully as it is here. And everything that's written here, I've talked about in my, in my in my talk, but you can search suffrage. So you can find someone, you could enter someone, it's interactive and meant for all of us to be able to participate. And you can map the suffrage, it, um, also look at map, look at the individual um, identities via map. Um, if you go to, um, first try, there I am. Um, if you go to Rochester, near Rochester, you'll see that there we are, we click on the map and there is Fanny Barry Williams, Brockport Cemetery on High Street in Brockport. And so it's just a very incredible project. And so if you have a moment, I believe it's coming up on Monday, attend, um, attend the talk. It's Linda Maroney, who's the filmmaker and um, her colleague, Laura Chekow. And they are, um, their work is just remarkable. So I'm happy that Barry Williams is now mapped into the project and part of that um, and hope that this will get her more visibility and, oops, um, better now. So I actually am really closing um, now uh, and want to just say a few words uh, as summary. So with all of her successes and impressive border crossings, scholars and the general public still know little about Fannie Barry Williams and there's so much more I could say about her. So in the, in the confines of this talk tonight, I have tried to summarize for you some of the very important highlights about her, but there's so much more that's remarkable about her. I want to change the, the, the fact that we don't know about her. So as I speak with you tonight, 
And as we go forward, I want to spread the word about Fanny Barry Williams, many extraordinary accomplishments and to document the many social justice and gender justice legacies that live on in her name. In this 100th year suffrage milestone that is for white women, let's lead the way, tell a new story, change the script, remedy past wrongs. We can and really must interrogate differential gradations of citizenship, freedom, political agency, and civic voice as stratified by race, gender, sexuality, immigration, class, and other social categories of identity. Fanny Barrier Williams did so courageously and with remarkable foresight. Brent Staples writing on Fanny Barrier Williams for the New York Times in February, 2019, captures Barrier Williams' words in this context, quote, black women had unique needs that were defined as much by race as they were by gender and region. This is precisely the intersectional framing that we must be conscious of and understand today. So as a collective community here as part of the Rochester Monroe County Library System in New York, I'm proud to salute Fanny Barrier Williams. She was a leader, an orator, an intellectual, a sociologist. She was brave and articulate. She was kind and compassionate. Fanny Barrier Williams, let's say her name, know her impact and tell her story. And so I started uh, back in February, a Twitter handle, hashtag FBW remembered. I don't tweet, um, but I would encourage all of you who do tweet to tweet out and get the word out about her. I would also say, tell one person about her that doesn't know about her and ask that person to tell another person and spread the word because it really is upon us to now make the effort to really change the script and become more informed of individuals like Fanny Barry Williams, who so, so um, admirably contributed to our gender gender and equal rights. So thank you again for this honor to speak today. I'd love to open the floor for questions and I'd be particularly honored to have a conversation with you and to get your thinking about um, Barry Williams because it's one thing to be able to say, here's my reading of this, um, but it's so much more important as we think about what, what are some of your thoughts about her? Did you know about her? I was saying to Brandon when when we were chatting before the talk, if I were to give the talk in person, I would have paused multiple times and perhaps posed a couple of questions, engaged in dialogue with you as I was speaking. And now's an opportunity to think about ways that um, we, you can contribute to the conversation. So I'll take questions and I wonder if I should stop my screen share. Um, Brandon, I'm gonna do that. Um, I can always go back to that if anybody wants to look at that again. Um, so I'll stop the screen sharing so that you can come in and see me. And then, um, yeah, so I'm looking at the chats. Um, I just want to mention briefly before we go to the question and answer, um, the program that uh, Dr. Lo Savoy mentioned next week that Linda Maroney will be part of is called Women in Politics, Continuing the Work. It's next Monday, October 26th from 6 to 8. Um, I put a link to register to it in the chat. Uh, we have lots of seats available. I'd love to see more people come to it. Linda is part of a real blue ribbon panel of speaking that night. Yeah, and the film that I sort of blocked on is called Election Day. That's the 2016 film that documents the pilgrimage to Suzumi Anthony's grade. Any of my students that are present, I'm gonna be showing you that film in my class so you get to see it. Um, but yeah, so I see a question um, from Melinda um, that I'll just sort of start with. Um, many suffragists and lectures are not well known as Suzumi Anthony, Elizabeth, Katie Stanton. And locating manuscript materials is, is more difficult given that much is not digitized and transcribed online, yes. In researching Fanny Barrett Williams' life, what was your approach to locating or published writings 
um, correspondence and archives. Yeah. So I want to say the most important thing is um, uh, Mary Jo Deegan's book, um, and this is her collected writings. So that's um, there for you. But also, you know, I have a little bit of an upper hand because I've done research on um, Barry Williams before this talk, and so I had sort of already dug into and collected those archives. Um, I've written to um, editors who anthologize feminist theory, and I've asked them to include particular pieces of Fanny Barry Williams' work. So that's another way that we could sort of use it in our teaching. We all use anthologies in our teaching. Barry Williams is not in any anthologies that I use. And so I did, you know, a, quite a bit of background, had quite a bit of background. And because I was engaged with the college, both in um, that plaque um, that I showed you in Hartwell, and then the luncheon, I'm one of the founders of the biennial luncheon. I've just done a lot of, you know, prior work. I think anybody could get this book um, in interlibrary loan. This is the collection of her writings, Mary Jo Deegan. And then Wanda Hendrick's um, book is just phenomenal. That's the biography of, um, and it's the only biography. Usually when we have famous people, they have multiple biographies, right? This is the only biographer. Um, and you could find that in the library as well. Um, and both of those are just incredible resources to find out more about um, Fanny Barry Williams. So thanks for that question. Um, I'm just going to go back up and sort of look at these in order. Um, so the next one is, hi, Professor, from uh, Alicia. Alicia, thank you so much for attending. Do you think that Susan B. Um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton felt that they would be fighting a losing battle if they tried to take on, yeah, including Black women in their fight? We still fight racism. Uh, today, so maybe they felt that in order to make progress in equality, small steps had to be taken rather than large ones that have a high, high risk of failing. I think that's really, really accurate. It doesn't dismiss their, you know, exclusion of women of color, right? I feel like, you know, that um, is something that's in many ways unforgivable as we think about racism today and confronting that. But absolutely, I believe this is true, and we see this repeat in feminist movements. So it was true in the suffrage movement where they were reaching for the pie, right? And they didn't want to be sidelined um, and thought that the moment that they, in many ways, their cultivation of women, of the Southern women was at the expense of leaving the women of color out, but they believed that cultivating the Southern women was the way to get the vote um, and ways to get men to buy into the vote. So they made compromises. And I think those compromises are important, but still hard to hard to really shoulder that right now. Um, this, you know, when I said that these exclusions repeat in the feminist movements in the 1960s, it was that they left the lesbians behind because they were so intent on um, Roe v. Wade and um, equal um, uh, wages that they were like, we'll come back for you, right? They, they said to the lesbian women, let's fight our fight. Um, the National Organization for Women, Betty Friedan, um, as an example, said, let's fight our fight. We're going to come back for the lesbians. And they didn't. And so, you know, in ways that are problematic with that thinking, it resulted in, in just, you know, I would say reinforced discrimination. Um, so, you know, retrospect, it's a postmodern reading right now. We're, we're thinking about this today. So it's easy to be critical of that um, as we stand here and analyze that today, but such an excellent question. So from Adriana, why do you think Williams is not known more in the history, especially on the local level? I wanna say that, that I think it's racism. I think that the narrative has been dominantly you know, occupied by white people. And I think because that's been a largely white narrative, they're not in the history books. We don't learn about women of color. So they're overlooked and slavery. Uh, Barry Williams was born at free. She was born into a free family. But when we think about slavery, women of color and the emancipation of people of color and black people, um, both men and women, were liberated at the same time, but they were absent of accessing the the rights of citizens and so that contributed to further discrimination and it erased their voices erased their contributions so the white not narrative is a dominant narrative and that narrative really uh, punishes in many ways women of color 
without giving them voice. But again, a, a good question, so thanks for asking it. So Boy Curry, can you speak a bit more about Barry Williams' involvement with places like Hull House in Chicago? Yes, thanks for asking that question. So I happen to know about Hull House in Chicago because Savoy Kari took me there um, in a visit to Chicago with her. And so Hull House was an important place for social work and sociology and helping in the arts. And this was something that Barry Williams was trained in, right? She went to the Conservatory of Music and she was engaged in the arts and she was engaged in culture. And when I mentioned that she and her husband um, crossed um, racial lines, they were very friendly with Jane Addams. And so um, thank you for asking the question, Savoy, because Fanny Barry Williams was involved in all of the efforts to promote the arts and help um, um, children and families in, in ways that Hull House is known for. So it's super, super important. And again, something that um, Williams is not well credited for. I don't remember, maybe Savoy, you can, you can tell me or you could go back, but I don't remember that, um, that um, Barry Williams is mentioned there, um, that her participation is mentioned there. And so it's worth you know, something to look into. And I'd be remiss to not say that Savoy Curry is my daughter. I know it's probably going to embarrass her, but she is um, related to me. So Savoy, thank you for taking me to Hull House and thanks for the question. Um, P.S. to everyone. Hi, Dr. Lee Savoy. Can Brockport students contribute to Fannie Barry Williams Memorialization on the campus? Yes, yeah, so there's a scholarship in her name and you can always donate to that. Um, that's awarded every other year. Um, and you can find out more about that through the Office of Development. And I think there's lots of opportunities to contribute that's not monetary. And that would be programming or doing research on her or talking to other professors and students about her. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can contribute to the memorialization of her. I would also say letter writing and advocacy because I'd love to get that statue um, erected. And so I've had conversations with one um, art faculty member in, uh, on the campus and asked her um, how much it would cost to um, to commission an artist to do a statue and sort of got a price tag there. And then, you know, thinking about, you know, moving that forward. So I think, you know, fundraising efforts for that or even just advocating for that would be a way that you can contribute. So thanks so much, um, whoever asked that question. Lisbeth. Um, hi, Professor. What captured your interest in learning about Fannie Barry Williams? And do you know if she's still recognized in the church that you stated? Um, it's such a good question. And her family participated in Brockport. Yeah, overall, if she was well known, do you think her role in the suffrage movement would have been big? Well, she was big in the suffrage movement. She advocated it importantly for both women and gender and um, in um, fighting for suffrage. She spoke with Frederick Douglass. Um, she was present at the suffrage convention. She was a suffrage fighter. So I think she's under recognized in that regard. I do not know, I know that she is her house and where she lived in Brockport. Um, and much of the village is now on board in remembering her and participating in joining hands with the college and trying to make sure that her memory is preserved. Um, I know that I mentioned that we were going to have the biennial luncheon in the fall. We were going to have a much bigger celebration where we were going to join hands with the village and really in the context of the 2020 milestone of suffrage and it being an election year, we had planned a much larger event. So unfortunately that had to be postponed and we'll do that at a, a future point. So when question about the church, I don't know. Um, I don't know if the Baptist church has any memorial that recognizes her, but it's a wonderful question that I should follow up on and discover um, because the church is there. So thanks for asking that. Um, and Savoy said that Barry Williams was not to her recollection, you know, mentioned in the display at Hull House. And if you're in Chicago, Hull House is just a remarkable place to visit. So recommend going there. Um, but Jane Addams, you know, knowledge of and friendship with the Williams, um, Samuel and Fanny were important. And so that should be added to their, to their display. So from CASA, um, 
Hi, Professor Lisa Boy. This might be a lame question, never a lame question, um, but a lot has been covered on Fanny, so I feel like I know a lot about her. Is there any ways that Fanny Barry Williams is recognized locally? I've heard there's a scholarship at SUNY Brockport in her honor. Is there anything in the village in her honor? I know we can contribute to getting a statue of, on campus of her. So the one, you know, we know that there's the annual Fannie Barry Williams launch biennial, that's every other year. And that's all that I know about. Um, I know that in every opportunity that we can, we talk her up. And so when we're programming for things in the student union, we try and remember her, um, but we could do a better job. I wanna say we could all do a better job. So as students, you have an incredible voice and you could talk to your student government, you could spread the word, you could write a newspaper article. There's a lot that you could do to really help um, bring the cause forward. So yeah, I think there's much that we could all do to, to get her name out there and make it at level with um, the important suffrage fighters of which she rubs shoulders with. So um, Kessa, thanks for your question. Um, from uh, Natea, hi, Professor. How has um, a woman like Fannie Barry Williams inspired you, if at all, as a woman say, oh, she's such an inspiration. I mean, first of all, every time I talk about her, I'm just in awe of her words. I think that her writings are sophisticated and brilliant, like far more, you know, sophisticated and complex than anyone gives her credit. When she was talking about unity across racial divisions, she talks about religion being separate from the institutionalized church, right? That's a super complicated and sophisticated thought. Um, she spoke about ways that we could combat racism and sexism. And I'm old and I've been fighting the gender fight for a really, really long time. And in many ways, I, I go back to someone like Fannie Barry Williams and I'm just in just awe and admiration for the challenges that she faced in her lifetime, a time of incredible racist division across the country. And she was so courageous in fighting for that. So she's inspirational to me. When I mentioned that I've written to editors of anthologies that I use in teaching feminist theory, it is with the effort to try and change ways we remember, right? And ways we remember about whose voices get visible and whose voices don't. And so it is my goal, at least in my lifetime, to try and change that, that menu. And then, um, hi again, Pablo. Pablo, thank you so much for coming. Um, do you know much about her relationship with suffragists other than Susan B. Anthony that were more open about the exclusion of people of color and their racism? So I know that, um, you know, I mentioned that she was um, connected with Washington and Frederick Douglass. Um, she was connected with Ida B. Wells Barnett who wrote on lynching and she was connected with Mary Church Terrell and Mary Ch Church Terrell wrote on lifting up the race through education. So those are two very, very prominent people. She was involved with other people of color. So absolutely. Um, and I just don't have their names in my, in my head right now, but I can grab Wanda's book or Mary Jo Deacon's book and start naming them. So she had a circle. They were um, a collective um, that were very much engaged with each other around the women of color club movement. And the club movement then was very active in the sense of moving the agenda forward for the inclusion of women of color. And in suffrage um, context, um, and this is true across the United States, that in many states, municipal elections preceded the right um, to, for the 19th Amendment, the federal passage. So that push for um, suffrage at the municipal or being franchised at the municipal level is super, super important. And so she was super engaged in that with many other women of color. Um, and yeah, it's a great question. And want, I need to go back to my books to name all of them. Um, but Mary Church Terrell and um, Ida B. Wells are really important. And Du Bois and, and um, 
and Washington and her connection with Washington. And another example of how sophisticated her writings are, if you wanna drill that down to say that, you know, Washington was supporting industrial education, well, I would argue that Fanny Barry Williams was supporting the necessity of work and education, right? And there's an important um, uh, labor intersection here that's very sophisticated. Um, and very connected to the labor movement. So again, like such an important piece of her work. Um, Cameron, did you have a question or are you back? <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't know if um, she sent, you sent it earlier. Can you say it again or can you talk? Can, Brandon, can people talk? Not a meeting. Absolutely. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to jump in the conversation. Um, Cameron, so I'm going to answer Andrea's question and then come back to you. Do you know what made her come back to Brockport? Well, her husband died. Um, so it was after her husband passed away. And I believe she just wanted to return to her family. Um, I, I think that that was her sister was alive. And so she returned really to be closer to her family and her roots. Um, and she lived, you can go by her house on Erie Street. So I think it was the absence of, you know, her husband and not wanting to be alone. Yeah, I believe that's what Wanda Hendricks noted in her biography, but it's also something that's, that's unknown, right? We know her as, you know, active in the circles of Chicago and um, all of the important connections she made there. And yet we don't really recognize her as coming back to our village and our campus and closing out our life. So important. Okay, anybody else? Cameron, I wanted to know what made you interested in studying this topic suffered. Well, you know, um, Cameron, I'm, it's my work, um, sort of what I do. I'm a woman, a gender studies scholar. Suffrage is part of our history. We understand the first wave of feminist um, movements as the early suffrage movement in granting women the right to vote. And that was in the 1800s leading up to the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, and having civic voice, the importance of civic voice is so important. In many ways, we attribute some of the inequalities, gender inequalities, to the separation of public and private, and that men got a larger share of the public sphere, which really allowed patriarchy to, to stick. So as we think about the importance of civic voice, it is about voting and exercising that right. Um, this is an election year, and I mentioned in my paper, it's an important election year. And so I would encourage all of you to go out and exercise your voice and think about how hard women have fought for that right to have civic and political voice, and particularly how hard someone like Fannie Barry Williams has fought. And I would hope that as you, you know, grow, or as my kids, you know, carry on with their adult lives, that your own kids will go to Brockport Central School and in your history book will be Fanny Barry Williams, right? And that on a field trip from your Brockport High School that you'd walk to the, to the cemetery and see her, right? Like that should absolutely happen. Um, and not that you would learn about it from, you know, one really accidental parent. <laughs> so, yeah. But thanks for your question. And I believe we have a question from Cheryl. Yes. Yes. Hi. I just want, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to mention that at, uh, the Rochester Museum and Science Center is opening an exhibit in November on inspiring women. And one of the women featured uh, will be Fanny Barrier Williams. So I uh, wanted to, to let you know that. And the thing is that in the exhibit, she's being featured uh, in, in spite, I think it's, um, I don't know, I can't remember the exact uh, constellation, but in the artistic side. And I was uh, trying to uh, do some of the research, found some things, but not exactly a lot. 
uh, versus what you would see in her more activist um, life. So just wanted to let everybody know, I believe it opens November 20th. I'm not sure if that's the exact date, but it's in November when the um, exhibit opens. Yeah, well, thank you so much, um, Cheryl, for sharing that. I do think that one of the things that I've noticed is the passage of the milestone of this passage of the 19th Amendment and the current context of that and our you know, more astute lens about exclusion has sort of circled around to give more voice to those who have been overlooked. And Fannie Barry Williams is certainly part of that. So when I quoted from Brent Staples in the New York Times, that was a year ago, going back almost a year ago. And that was in preface of sort of leading up to the 19th Amendment and looking at women of color who had been overlooked. Um, and so it's reassuring in some ways and so important to know that there are, that we are making headway in that regard. And indeed there are um, so much more that we could do, but I'm grateful to know that she's being, that she's being profiled. I'd love to see, see when I think about Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and I admire their work, so I don't want to at all allude to the fact that I don't admire their work. But I do wish that we could, you know, make a museum that that keeps the the artifacts about Fanny Barry Williams and in Brockport we have, you know, a place that we could go. I know the Brockport Historical Society has a display on her. Um, I'm not sure who the local historian is now, but I know that that has been included. Um, so yeah, but thank you, Cheryl. I'm glad to know that it's reassuring. And this is the exhibit. Thanks, um, um, Brandon, for putting that up there. So yeah, I want to say, like, say, you know, with all of your questions, I want to say, tell someone about Fanny Barry Williams. Find out more about her. Learn more about her. Twitter her. That hashtag is for all everybody who tweets. Tweets, right? So you could go out and you could you know, say like, here's, you know, something I learned tonight about Fanny Barry Williams. That would be a great way to, to get the word out. Just so, so remarkable. So yeah, I'm inspired by your comments and her work. Do we have any final questions? Anybody else? Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's always a pleasure to be able to talk about things that I'm interested and excited about. Um, and I hope that you've learned something by participating. And I'm so thankful, Brandon, for being invited to say a few words about Fanny Barry Williams. Oh, to Cheryl, do you have your hand up? Do you want to say something else? Or is that from before? Uh, that was from before. OK, great. <laughs> Thanks again. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Savoy, for speaking again for us. This was terrific. I, I learned a great deal tonight about Fanny Barrier Williams, who really had just been a name and, and a face and, and my understanding of local history till now. Great. Well, and, uh, I hope to see you on our future programs. Great, thanks again, Brandon. You're welcome. Take care.